Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy, a podcast that looks at the inspiration, intention, and actionable steps to help you jumpstart joy in the world, in your life, and in other people's lives. This is your host, Paula Jenkins. Welcome to episode 168. This week on the show, you guys, I'm so excited to have Johnny Pollard on. He is the author behind the book, The Golden Sequence, and he's also the co-founder of One Giant Mind, which is a which is a meditation app and company that trains meditation instructors. I just love this conversation so much, and I know you guys are going to as well. Uh, It's just one of those conversations that kind of washes over me and reminds me of who I am and reminds us all of our deeper connection. And I think you're really going to find it to be a great start to 2019. Johnny is, you know, he goes deep um, and he really kind of talks about multi-passionates in a new way. Also talks about why we all need to reconnect with our divinity and our true nature, uh, why it's important now more than ever. And I think you're really just going to love his insights. Before we get to the show, I want to wish you guys a very happy 2019 and say thank you so much, as always, for tuning in to Jumpstart Your Joy. It's a podcast that comes out every Tuesday, and we've been going for over four years. Thank you so much for tuning in each week and always. And this week, I want to give a big shout out to B. Roberts, who gave a lovely review on iTunes. And B. Roberts says, Paula's infectious delight is hard to match, and she interviews such engaging and interesting guests. Each episode is inspiring and they all have actionable ideas to improve the quality of my life and my small biz. Thank you so much for writing and uh, sharing your thoughts on the show. You guys, I do love and read each one of your reviews. So be sure to jump over to iTunes and uh, review and subscribe. Of course, if you are not already subscribed. If you want to find out more about Jumpstart Your Joy, you can head to the website as well at jumpstartyourjoy.com and you can listen to 167 past exciting episodes and learn more about the inspiration, intention, and action that I see as an integral part of finding your joy and following it in your life. While you're there, you can also find the show notes for this episode with links to Johnny's website along with the One Giant Mind app and his great book. And that is all at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash Johnny, J-O-N-N-I. And if you are thinking in the new year that you want to start your own podcast, there is a quick and easy handy guide over at the site. You can download that as well while you are there. Uh, Off of the homepage, it's uh, behind the link that says start a podcast. And a little bit about what I have been doing and where I'm going this week. Uh, The family went up to Mendocino in the north coast of California this last week, and we we had a nice time. We stayed in Airbnb, and then we headed over to a, a cottage, uh, also right on the ocean. It was so beautiful. It's such a lovely part of the world. My heart always feels very uh, rejuvenated to have spent time there. And this coming Wednesday, so just tomorrow as this comes out, I'm headed back up north to Petaluma, where I will be uh, attending the CLCC Uh, annual retreat where just over 40 women will be attending and they are all studying to become life coaches. And it is my deepest honor this year to be one of the lead coaches for this program. You could find out more if you're thinking of becoming a coach at teamclcc.com. So let's just jump right on in with this great interview with Johnny Pollard. Welcome to the show, everybody. This week, I am super excited to have on Johnny Pollard first question I ask everybody is, what did you love most as a child or in school? What were your earliest sparks of joy? I think my earliest sparks of joy, definitely playing with kids I really loved. I loved games that there was a a sense of progress and evolving and advancing. We used to, you know, play games where we'd line up the, the bench seats that we'd all sit at lunch. Mm -hmm. on and jump over them and I remember in the mornings we used to play this you know as we got older 
and taller, we were able to jump more seats. And I remember it went on for years in primary school. <laughs> it was this thing, how many benches could you jump? Mm-hmm. And it was just such a fun thing because we were all pushing each other to get that little bit further. It was exciting and there was a, a beautiful sort of bond in the group of the boys that were doing it. So I've got very fond memories of things like that. Mm-hmm. I used to love skate, skateboarding and riding my bike and jumping off things and you know so anything that was kind of exciting and and that that felt like I was advancing and progressing in capability uh, used to always really light me up. I like that a lot because it's it's interesting that there's the the connection and the excitement. I, I get a lot of that from you as as who you are now, like in your book and what you connect to. It's just fascinating to see how those things play through to someone's current day. Mm, Yeah, yeah, for sure. That that definitely is a theme that's stuck with me (laughs) my whole life. I'm always gravitating towards anything that's going to give rise to greater progression in my capability Mm. and that it's also exciting and it has some, some degree of, you know, connection and community involved in it as well. I feel like you have a very varied background, kind of what some of us would call almost a multi-potentialite, multi-passionate, where you've dabbled in a lot of things, I, I get the sense. How do you see your path going from from that that boy at school? What were the influential things that then brought you to be the founder at One Giant Mind and and coming into this this knowledge and the and this Vedic tradition. Well, it's funny. I guess from the outside, it would appear, you know, particularly some of the the things that I've done seem quite sort of random and oddly <laughs> matched. You know, having been a, an actor, a professional rollerblader, a painter. From the inside looking out, these are all sort of buds off the flower, off the stem, the flower stem that all sort of derive from the one, the one stem. They just may be different colors, you know, but they're they're all the same kind of flower to me. Yeah. For looking from the inside out, they're all just expressions of, I guess the the multifacetedness of, of my of my personality. But we're yeah. all very multifaceted, right? We've we've mm-hmm. all got many dimensions to us, and I was just one of those people that was very insistent on being expressive of all of those, and probably sometimes simultaneously and. I mean, I guess that's how I would probably characterize myself um, yeah. growing up as somebody that was just relentless in self-expression and, you know, just doing what I absolutely loved and and really, you know, diving into everything that I that I did and giving all of myself to that. All of, all of the different things that I've done in my life all sort of amounted to gaining deeper insight into who I am, what I love, what my capability is. Mm -hmm. And as that kind of continued to be revealed to me, I became more interested in the the sort of the underlying themes of my experience that unified all of these expressions, you know, like Mm -hmm. skating and painting, what was common in all of them, you know, and it was a a deep desire to be expressive and to share in that, that expression and it led to the inquiry about what is the source and reason for it all? Is there a greater purpose for my for my creative desire? Is there a way that I can channel this that might be of some greater use and meaning and purpose in in life? And that uh, you know then led me very deep into myself, you know, questioning the whole why of my existence, <laughs> and yes. and then desiring to really understand that in the most pragmatic way. Mm-hmm. And that, that's how I've ultimately arrived at who and what I am today. In that journey of, of asking why, I, I was fortunate enough to be led to India and to discover the ancient wisdom that's, that's kept over there. Uh, that's not exclusively Indian by any means, but um, right. is, is, is very rich there. And I was fortunate enough to, to have great teachers over there that were able to satiate my inquiry and lead me deeper. And, mm-hmm. and and create a uh, context for me to be a man from the Western world and to to embody this knowledge in a way that it'd be relevant to the Western world and to, to share it in the way that I am now. That's kind of a, br- a very broad brushstroke, one color sort of description of the journey. 
Yeah, I think it's especially helpful because we have a lot of people on the show that do have a multitude of interests. And I I like the context that you have given because I think that's a, it's maybe even a little different than anything anyone else has said thus far in four years. But like that it's mm-hmm. really that. And, and I think it's a truth that like it's that deeper inquiry about who am I and what am I here to do? And so all these things, yeah, to an outsider would look like maybe there's not a connection. But then the other exciting thing is, of course, there's always there's a daisy chain that connects all of them for the person who's seeing it from the inside out, which I think yeah. is, is interesting as well. It's just society wants us to be, oh, you're a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, right? <laughs> so <laughs> then when we see these outcroppings of interests in a different way, it's it seems unusual. Uh, yeah, totally. And this, is, this brings up a really interesting point because, you know, from the outside yeah, looking in, you know, you we are looking at a filter, uh, through a filter, that is needing us to compartmentalize each other in order to understand and contextualize each other relative to social standards. In that respect, we're always defining ourselves by what we do and not why we do it and how we do it. And I was, and this is why I was always at odds with the world uh, growing up because I was all about the why and specifically the how. And for me, there was a commonality in absolutely everything that I did, which was it was a gateway for me to understand myself more, whether it was me, you know, throwing myself off a off a ramp, uh, with, you know, skating and, mm-hmm. and trying to land a, du- a double flip, uh, you know, in a very small space or something. The challenge of that was revealing to me, you know, who who I am and and my, what my capability is to you know set a challenge and to en- engage with the constraints and then to to meet the challenge and be you know successfully execute the the trick. And in doing so, I gave myself enormous levels of fulfillment and um, confidence in my ability to, to pose a challenge, meet the challenge, engage with the challenge creatively through trial and error and arrive at uh, an insight of the way to, to actually succeed. Mm-hmm. And I, I would apply that same principle to my painting you know, as, a, as an oil painter, having an image inside of my mind about what it was I wanted to produce with having no real technical understanding of how to how to achieve that and then just applying myself until I discovered how to create the effect again mm-hmm. I, cor- I I correlate doing a you know a double backflip off a ramp and you know trying to get a tone a gradient of two contrasting colors to create a sense of three dimensionality on the canvas mm-hmm. being one and the same thing you know, because my why was to discover capability and to be expressive of something that was deep inside of me. And my how was persistence, patience, um, led by curiosity and inquiry. That again was underlined or driven by a creative desire, which is essentially what we are as human beings. Right. We're, we're knowing creatures that are driven by an impulse of creative intelligence to be expressive of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And this is the underlying sort of tenet of, of the teaching and that's contained in the Golden Sequence, my, my, my latest book. Mm-hmm. And I always start off with any of my teachings by defining our humanity th- through this lens, is that who and what we are essentially are creative beings that are governed by this desire to be expressive. And when we are connected to that, we have within us all that we require in order to understand who we are, what we are, and not only that, to connect to a deep sense of meaning and purpose in our lives, be expressive of that, fulfill that, and therefore experience profound levels of fulfillment because we're in a constant state of progressing and growing our understanding of who we are and what our place is in the world. Yes. And that's the, the, the sort of the foundational reason for my being, you know, and that's, that's always been prevalent right at a very early age. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I found it challenging fitting into the world was because I was asked to define myself by what I was doing, not mm-hmm. why I was doing or how I was doing it. The what was kind of like a, a tertiary thought. It didn't matter what I did. It was, you know, it was what was the reason for it and what was I getting out of it? Yeah. And yeah, so it's an interesting thing you bring up. 
Yeah. Well, and I, and I got that, that kind of as a through line subtly in your book, or maybe, and maybe it was, it was looming large even, but that I really loved, you had a quote later on about how the answers are in our hearts, not our, in our heads. And I, I think it's that same thread a little bit, right? Like we intuitively, yeah. or when we connect to source or whatever we use for that word, when we go deep and understand ourselves, that would be the heart piece, at least in the way I would unpack your, yes. your quote. And then, but yet we get programmed at such an early age. And that's probably what exactly what you were talking about. I know in your book, you also mentioned people were um, always keen to define, especially from a religious standpoint of like, who are we and what does that mean we do and how do we behave in the world? Because this is who we identify with. Like the, I would say that's kind of the head part of it, right? The reason why conditioning as children is so powerful is because our hearts are open and we mm-hmm. take on board everything that we're, that we're seeing, we're modeling, and we take it to heart. And mm-hmm. those, those ideologies become deeply embedded in our heart. And this is why it's so difficult to, to overcome our conditioning yes. because we've, ta- we've taken it to heart. If it was just an idea, the heart would always just overcome Right. Um, and it, this is what makes us very complex creatures as, hu- as human beings is mm-hmm. that we, d- we do model the, the, the world and the reality that is around us and that we're exposed to. Our environment has a huge impact on who we become as people and who we believe we are as people and how we show up and interact. And the great challenge is learning to uh, distinguish or discern the difference between an ideology that we have um, adopted, the ideology that is spontaneous and flows freely through our hearts. And this is why so many of us experience a a degree of conflict and anxiety and self-doubt and uncertainty is that there is a, uh, a conflict in who we know ourselves to be and what we desire to be expressive of. And what we've learned as an external model of who we are expected to be in mm-hmm. order to fit in and, 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 and belong to a, a status quo that doesn't necessarily take into consideration our, our own individual desi- creative desires to be expressive of what's sort of naturally happening inside of us. And it's, it's the, the adopting of this model and conforming to that that causes immense suffering in us as human mm-hmm. beings and, and immense confusion about who we are yeah. and makes our lives very, very complicated. So sorry, what was the question you were asked? How do we overcome <laughs> that? <laughs> well, <laughs> much, as it would go, I think you answered the question I was going to ask, which was like, how do we, I don't know, how do we either, when we sense that we are not who we've been told we are, that seems a little um, esoteric, but Mm -hmm. when we've started to get to that point in our lives, and I think many of us do, and it's probably when we reach that point of suffering, you mentioned that this doesn't feel right. I don't know what's next. Um, You allude to some of it coming out in people when they're questioning a career choice or their path there. But when we get to that point, how do we start to get back in touch or rediscover that which is truly our nature and that is our purpose and that would lead to our own fulfillment? Mm. Well, the good news is that all of those things you just described, even knowing our true nature, understanding our purpose and living a fulfilling life is actually Mm. the single most natural thing for us to experience. (laughs) If we know how to access the place where that knowingness resides, as I said before, when knowing beings inherent in our experience of ourselves is a knowingness of who we are. The extent to which we don't know ourselves or feel we, we, we cannot trust that sense of knowingness is the extent to which we have been influenced by external influences that we have taken on as an ideology identity. The, the great challenge that we have is dissolving that externally referenced identity and surrendering to a deeper sense of who we are, which I describe as that knowingness, mm-hmm. and, uh, and cultivating a relationship with that sense. Now, 
this is this is what the the book The Golden Sequence concerns itself with entirely the mm-hmm. process of of reestablishing the truth of who we are, reclaiming our humanity is the tagline. You know, yeah. each of us are, as human beings are defined as no, knowing beings, know it meaning that we we have a deep sense of who we are, what we are, and what our purpose is. And if we can allow ourselves to make committing to that sense a priority, then what naturally occurs is we become acquired by that knowingness. It's like a a, a, a spontaneous defragging of the of the of the program, if you like, or the conditioning. Mm-hmm. The more we expose ourselves to that knowingness, it becomes stimulated and enlivened, and it generates a force within us that swells in the heart. You, you described a sense of no, uh, uh, intuition flowing from mm-hmm. our heart as opposed to our head. Mm-hmm. We have, as beings, a, a feeling center that we can sort of point to in our chest. In that sensation is a strong sense of certainty about what's happening in this present moment, what our place is in this present moment, and the most appropriate response to the present moment, whatever it is that we're interacting with, that gives rise to the highest level of expression of what we are as humans. And when we are connected to that beautiful flow of heartfelt knowing and are able to be unconditionally expressive of that in the present moment, what occurs is a profound sense of meaning in our interaction and our transactions with whatever or whomever we're interacting with that gives rise to deeper connection both to ourselves and those that we're interacting with, a deeper sense of understanding about who and what we're in relationship with, why we're in relationship with it, and how to continue cultivating ever deepening experiences of connection and being in relationship. And what that does is it nurtures the very uh, fabric of what makes us humans, which is that we belong to each other and we belong to life. When we, when we have this deep sense of belonging both to ourselves and each other in our connections, in our relationships, we feel very safe and very free to be expressive of everything that emerges in the moment. Mm-hmm. And this is actually what we're yearning for most, is just to be free in our expression of who and what we are and to be able to do that and share that. And for, for that expression to have some significance and relevance that is going to somehow better the world, you know, serve the greater good in some way. And this, here, this is the, 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 the formula for the, the deepest level of human fulfillment, being yeah. free to fully express your heart and for that expression to be somehow contributing to others experiencing a greater depth of themselves and um, feeling loved and supported in some way that enables them to feel free to then pass that on to others. Yes. But that ties back to the fulfillment is our purpose part of the four golden insights. Would you like to go through those four? And then, of course, I have questions about the fulfillment part because I think that's like so, uh, ah, it's so hard to crack once we're already on our way. But yeah, would you go through the four golden insights? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. So the four golden insights are aphorisms, if you like. They're like the the cheat sheet that (laughs) defines who we are, why we're here, and how best to bring ourselves into the world to give rise to the most fulfilling and meaningful experience as human beings. And so the the purpose of the the four golden insights are to, to act as pillars whenever we are experiencing some kind of dissonance or anxiety or uncertainty to reestablish our foundation. And they are the precursor to the actual golden sequence technique, which we can talk about as well, mm-hmm. if you like. Um, so these, these, four, these four pillars act as the, the foundation for doing the golden sequence work. But the first of the four golden insights is life is sacred. 
this is the fundamental truth of our humanity. Mm-hmm. When we remove fear and we are able to innocently be here now in the present moment and allow our senses to connect with the, the experience of being alive, just the revelation of our, ex- of our existence yields a profound understanding of the magnificence and the, mag- the magnitude of our existence. The fact that we are aware and can comprehend that we exist in this extraordinary universe and, and comprehend the level of intelligence, the, the magnanimous nature of it, how big it is. It's just, it's extraordinary. The revelation is that, oh my goodness, I exist and isn't it extraordinary <laughs> and uh, isn't it the, the single most precious thing, my existence, that I exist? This is, a, this is the deepest truth that defines us as human beings, that we can behold the magnificence of our own existence. And we refer to that revelation as sacredness. Life is sacred. Now, this is the, 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 the first principle that then gives rise to the second golden insight. Love is our nature. Mm-hmm. Love and love is our nature um, is revealed within the first revelation that life is sacred. When we behold the sacredness of life, we immediately experience a swelling in our heart, a compulsion or an instinct to want to serve, nurture, cultivate an ever deepening relationship to the sacredness of life. When we truly behold the sacredness of life, all we want to do is nurture it to go, oh my God, it's so amazing. I just want to be ever in ever deepening connection and relationship with it. Mm -hmm. And I define this as love. Love is that instinct to want to nurture connection, shared growing experience and belonging to whatever and whomever, whomever we are interacting with or engaging with. It's a very simple definition of love, and it is spontaneous. It's instinctive. It's it's the first thing that occurs when we behold the sacredness of life. When we know when when we behold something as sacred, what do we want to do? Is nurture it Mm -hmm. so that we can grow it, cultivate it. Um, And so, out of out of the the second golden insight, love is our nature, emerges the third, and the third is. Wisdom is our power. And I define wisdom as the intelligence of love. So the instinct to nurture greater connection, growth, and belonging um, to that which we behold as sacred is the uh, expression of love. And the way that love expresses itself is through wisdom. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple, elegant way of defining wisdom. Wisdom is that intelligence that is always seeking to reconcile the uh, appearance of opposites, the appearance of what is seemingly irreconcilable. It is always seeking to bridge the gap between things that appear separate to understand the underlying unity within it. And that's actually what we as humans are always seeking out to do when we fall in love with somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what is, the, what is the, the experience that we're having that makes that the, the most magnificent and coveted experience that we humans can have? It is the revelation that we are the same. The, the reason why I, lo- I love you is because I see myself in you. Right. And we become the, the beautiful mirrors for each other. You're like me, you're like me, you're like me, is the mm-hmm. mantra of love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and really, when we fall in love, what we're really falling in love with is ourself, right. and, which, is a be- which is a beautiful thing because, you know, when we, when we go deeper into the esoteric nature of our humanity, you know, what we, what we recognize is that we share a universal nature. We are universally characteristically uh, unified 
you know, right. we are all the same in terms of what fulfills us, what lights us up, what, what brings us the greatest joy is essentially the same thing. And we, by our very nature, are, are defined at a deepest and truest level when we are sharing in that universal nature. Mm-hmm. We, we, we become the most that we are as human beings when we are able to freely share that deepest nature and to recognize it in each other as same. It causes this profound sense of belonging that makes us understand who and what we are and enables us to anchor ourselves in the present moment and reside here and feel safe to do that because we only abandon the present moment and abandon our humanity when we don't feel safe. Right. And when we, when we feel, well, we feel afraid and we're, we're mistrusting. And so, um, going back to the four golden insights, wisdom, wisdom is our power. Wisdom is the intelligence that informs us of how we can sustain connection to the present moment to constantly be nurturing a deep, heartfelt, loving connection with whatever and whomever we are engaging with, irrespective of whether they see the world the way we see it, to still have the power, the immense power to create a unity experience, a connection with somebody or something that is so insistent on defining themselves as being different. (laughs) Mm -hmm. This is power. And when we look at all the world's problems right now, it is the, the insistence on defining what makes us different, separate from each other, mm-hmm. rather than what unifies us, what we share in, that reminds us of our responsibility of belonging to each other. Right. It's the ignorance of our responsibility of belonging that is creating all of the problems. If we abandoned all the things that we were so attached to that define us as being separate and different from each other, if we could just let go of that for a moment and put our attention on what it is that unifies us as humans, it would immediately awaken the deepest sense of responsibility to nurture belonging. And we would start moving in the direction of resolving our differences, reconciling our differences, so that we could coexist symbiotically, which is to say coexist with a a, a sense of responsibility for that transaction to always be mutually beneficial. Right. And and this is what I describe as uh, wisdom. Wisdom is that power to always be generating mutually beneficial dynamics that the, the truth of who we are is always highlighted that we are interconnected, we share a universal nature, and our highest experience is gained when we are always cognizant of our responsibility to be serving each other and to be nurturing each other. There's that big, (laughs) maybe elephant in the room of how do we start to shift that sense with one another. I mean, it's obviously the only thing I can ter- control is what I can do for myself and immediately mm. right here, right now. But how do we start to shift that when there's so much antagonism and separateness? How do we mm-hmm. bridge that gap? We, ha- we have to graduate ourselves into the position of embodied leadership. And mm-hmm. what that means is em- embodying the truth of who we are. And yeah. when I say wisdom is our power, I mean that literally. When we embody love and, and be expressive of it through wisdom, mm-hmm. we become powerful. And right. what does power mean? The ability to influence the environment around us. When, yep. when somebody is truly embodied in love, <clears throat> their presence becomes this force of influence that elevates everyone and everything that steps into its event horizon. Mm -hmm. and causes it to rise in its expression. And so true true power is the ability to, even in silence, in your presence, 
elevate everyone and everything that is within proximity of you. And this is the very nature of our humanity is that we are always influencing each other. <laughs> our thoughts, yes. our feelings, our ideologies, our behavior, everything that, that, that we are experiencing is being transmitted from us. We are constantly, perpetually influencing everyone around us, the environment, and we are informing our collective consciousness of who, who and what we are by our individual experiences. And we have forgotten this. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the most important aspects of our humanity that we have forgotten is that we belong to a collective whole. Right. And that we are, we are a collective species and we are governed by the collective status quo, the mainstream mm -hmm. of our collective consciousness. And yeah. it's very difficult as individuals to defy the mainstream flow of collective consciousness. It requires great character and an immense sense of self and confidence to go against the grain of what everybody's doing. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the sum total of our individual states of awareness, our, our, uh, the sum total of our collective state of consciousness, Create, creates a, um, a collective field, a collective force that then informs us of who we are as individuals. Mm -hmm. And herein lies how we become conditioned. Right. Uh, the, the, the force of conditioning is immense because it is the force of all of us as individuals as one unified collective force of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That becomes like the the mainframe of who we who we become, and so we have an immense responsibility. That if we know that we are not being who we know we truly are, then we have a responsibility to enlighten and awaken that truth, because that is the force that is going to be emitted into the collective field of who we are and start yes. informing who we are of the truth of who we are. <laughs> <laughs> and if, we, if we're just constantly conforming to the fear of influence from, from outside of ourselves and not committing to the truth of who we are, then the world will never change. Right. And so you ask the question, how do, we, how, do we, how do we embody, how do we create the change? We must first embody it. We must first mm. embody the truth of who we are. Right. Admit that into the world and start, start observing the profound influence that we can have through our kind, loving, wise, powerful hearts. Mm -hmm. This is the solution. This is the pathway out. There is no other pathway out other than each of us as individuals embodying, embracing the responsibility of our humanity mm -hmm. and, mm. uh, and, and nurturing it as the greatest and most important aspect of our, huma of our purpose which right. leads to the fourth golden insight. Fulfillment mm -hmm. is our purpose. Fulfillment is the experience of being expressive of who we truly are. The gross misconception around fulfillment is that it is an acquisition game, meaning that we acquire fulfillment through acquiring things outside right. of ourselves, relationships, jobs, wealth, status, fame, sex, all of these things. Mm-hmm we don't actually gain fulfillment through the acquisition of any of these things. We can gain moments of kind of, you know, momentary contentment, but true fulfillment is um, born of through knowing ourselves, knowing who we are, what we are, what our me meaning and purpose of our existence is, and being able to fearlessly be expressive of that in every moment. And, for that fulfillment to be something that we export, not import. Fulfillment is not something that we import into ourselves through acquisition. It is something right. that we export through the knowingness of who we are. Fulfillment is an internally referenced phenomenon, as is love. You know, when we fall in love, we're not, the love is not happening outside of ourselves. That love is happening inside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's an experience that's happening within us. And so fulfillment is happening within us and it is generated from within us. And when we realize that fulfillment 
is really an express, expression of our knowingness of who we are, why we're here, and how to um, bring that uh, experience of ourselves into the world in some meaningful way that is going to trigger that in others. Mm-hmm. When we when we realize that we can do that and we make that our purpose, then we have found the formula for the most enriching and powerful life available to us. And so mm-hmm. that's why the fourth gold insight, fulfillment is our purpose, sort of culminates all, all the three prior building into it. it it's kind of, it, it caps it off. Life is sacred. Love is our nature. Wisdom is our power. And through that power, we, we, we realize fulfillment is an internally referenced thing. And when we make that fulfillment our purpose, then we have everything that we require to, to keep our humanity stable, to keep the truth of our humanity always present online in the moment and immensely forceful in terms of being able to stimulate that in others, awaken mm-hmm. that, enliven it in others. Right. Mm, yes, <laughs> that's the good stuff right there. Well, and, and yeah. it, it strikes me as you're saying it, and as I read it, was like, that's the thing. Like I endeavor to do, you know, like that's the jumpstart your joy. That's the reminding of like, no, here's your divinity. Do you can you remember this piece of yourself and get back in mm. touch with that and live that forward? Because I think that's what the world or I don't, I don't even know what the force is that wants us to play so small and and wants us to stay in that conditioned state. I, but like, how does that work? Like, where does that come from? Let's just call that out for what it is. Yeah. That 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 force is just simply the the discord of a circuit being broken. Okay. Now, yeah. energy energy is always flowing. And when an energy has a circuit to flow through, the flow of that, uh, of that energy is coherent. There's no resistance. And so it, the, the, with, with zero resistance, the energy can flow coherently. We mm-hmm. break that circuit and the channel for that energy to flow through is no longer there. And so it, it, it gets dispersed chaotically, incoherently. And that, that d- the dispersing or the distribution of that energy without a clear channel starts to create a, a resonance of dissonance, mm. if you like. Yeah. And look, if you think about the human heart mm-hmm. and our sense of awareness of ourself, when we put the fact that we can put our attention in on our heart and connect with the feelings there. Mm-hmm. If, if we are experiencing anxiety, it means that there is some circuit in our heart that is not connected to allow the flow, the truth of who we are, which is that we are immensely powerful, creatively intelligent, and, in, and, and capable of meeting any challenge and demand that life throws at us in the present moment to transform mm-hmm. that experience into something that is evolutionary, something that is progressive for us, something that is going to inform us of our ability to progressively move from one version of ourselves and iterate into the next and into the next and into the next because that's all that's happening. Mm -hmm. And when when we forget that, a circuit is broken and there is a a dissonance that is created and that dissonance we call fear. Mm -hmm. Fear is just the disconnection from the truth of our capability. It is a, a epiphenomenon, a secondary effect of the circuitry of connection to our humanity being broken. Mm -hmm. And so when we reconnect the circuitry, when we sit with ourselves, and we'll talk about this because that's what the golden sequence is, it's technology Mm -hmm. for reconnecting the circuitry. So when we experience fear, that dissonance causes a, a, a physiological effect which says that there is danger Mm-hmm. We are, we have, we have lost connection to our, our sense of capability. We have lost connection to our sense of knowingness. We don't know where we are. Therefore, we are vulnerable and yes. susceptible to a threat. And 
what we need to do is be ever vigilant and on guard for danger. And so what we do is we, we abandon the intelligence of love and the mm-hmm. present moment and we replace it for a hyper strategic defensive worldview that is always forward looking, always looking into the future to try and preempt a, a threat that is almost always imagined. Right. It's not even real. Right. And when we are exposed to that reality for too long, we normalize it and we right. forget that love and power and fulfillment are even an option. We have a very faint um, sense of it that is experienced more as a, a yearning and a longing and for most a, a deep sort of sadness mm, because yeah. our, so- our souls mourn the disconnection. Mm. When, we are di- when we are disconnected and we are not yeah. fully expressive of our humanity, our souls, it, it, it grieves. And mm-hmm. if you feel, if you're somebody listening to this and you feel this deep sadness, you don't know why, it's, it's that. It's the right. soul grieving. And yeah. what, what you need to do now is start tending to that, that, that sadness as you would a child in the corner of a, of a cold, dark room, curled up in the corner, crying. Right. What would you do? What would you do to that? <laughs> if you, if you, you would embrace child, that child. You would go to comfort them in some way. Yeah. Our instinct is to go straight over there, take a warm blanket. You know, yeah. turn, turn on turn on a warm light, bring a pillow, mm-hmm. hold them, and go. Hey, what's going on? Are you yeah. okay? We're You're connected. Okay? I, I'm You're here. here. Now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And this is what we need to do. We need to we need to parent our souls. We need yeah. to go over and give ourselves a bigger old hug and hold on to ourselves. Mm. Allow our process of establishing trust because initially that child is probably going to reject you. Might push right. you away initially. Because it's you? been a Why while. It doesn't know you. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's still scared and confused. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Oh exactly. God. We can, we can reject ourselves. We can reject our own love. You know, mm. we go to give ourselves self love and we can tell ourselves, we can say all kinds of mean things to ourselves when we try to give ourselves love. And yeah. it, can, it can hurt. It can actually hurt giving ourselves love. You yes. know, why have you rejected me? Why have you rejected me? It, this is, and this is so primal to us, by the way. Mm, it really and, is, and, yeah. And we, we need to learn how to sit, to, to, to be the adult in this dynamic. And despite the fact that we reject ourselves and, mm-hmm. and push ourselves away, to stay and to continue holding, holding tightly and going, yes. no, it's okay, I'm here. Okay. No, it's okay. I'm here. Yeah. And Uh, you're giving me goosebumps because there's like, (laughs) like I mentioned, I have a background in religious studies and my very favorite, I just got to put this out there. My very favorite line in the Bible, which is a very, it's a strange one to be favorited, but is when Jesus cries out on the cross and he says, father, father, why have you forsaken me? That's Mm. this moment. That's what you're just talking about. Like, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. It's it's Mm -hmm. unconditional love, but for yourself. And you're still, Mm -hmm. you're going to cry out and say, Mm. why have you forsaken me? Because you you may have. Like, it's uncomfortable, but here it comes. And when you put that back on yourself and you can love yourself in that way, it's it's what? The reconciliation of all things. So beautifully put. (laughs) And that correlation is spot on. Oh, you know, that's, yeah. exactly, that's exactly what was going on. Right. And, you know, and, and because it's the was, Trinity and the wisdom, not, uh, uh, you and I could have an entire discussion around this thing, but like, mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, ultimately, you know, what Jesus was trying to do was demonstrate <laughs> that even in the face of death, we can discover love. Mm-hmm. We, 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 we can understand Love, love exists beyond all of it, beyond right. the greatest fear, which is the fear of death. Hey, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow you to do this. I'm gonna let you take, take my body and all of this, and I'm gonna demonstrate that love exists beyond all of it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, beyond the fear of death, love still exists. Right. And this was just a very powerful, crude <laughs> way. Mm-hmm. 
you know, it's taking a baseball bat to humanity and going, look, mm-hmm. you know, here, yeah, kill me. <laughs> right. And, and, and I will still and love I'll, you. <laughs> and, I'll sh- and I'll show you. But there will yeah, still be love. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And it's just a, de- a, a, just a beautiful demonstration of this thing. And, and what gets misconstrued, I believe, in, in the teaching of Jesus is that, you know, only he was able to do that. And if that's how you interpret it, you've missed the point. Because what he was saying was, <laughs> right. hey, guys, look, we're all human. And look, you can do this. Yes. This What I'm trying to show you is that you, this, is, this, is, this is the way to go. <laughs> and you can all choose so, love. Yeah. And even, yeah. I mean, even in the greatest of these is love. I mean, like, he's pretty, uh, uh, the term that comes to my head is like flat footed about this. Like he, he tells us and tells us and shows us. <laughs> like, yeah. This is over and yeah. Over. Yeah. 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 It's so yeah. uncanny. And I'll say, I don't know if you've read the wisdom Jesus by Cynthia Borgio. Have you? Or no, Borgio? I no. Oh, no. I don't know if you're reading any of those things, but for the audience, I'll put it in the show notes, but it's the whole unpacking of how Jesus is teaching or very much within the wisdom literature and like the wisdom tradition, which is mm-hmm. very unlike a lot of what Christianity will say today, but uh, I'll, I'll rein that yeah. back in. But <laughs> Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was, he was, a you know, a, a very enlightened seer mm-hmm. um, yes. and someone who had spent his, his life sitting and deeply reflecting on the nature of, of, of existence and then awoke to the truth and was compelled by that immense responsibility and yes. stepped out and started teaching. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there have been countless, you know, beings that have walked the earth that, that, that have, have done the same in India, you mm-hmm. know, the, 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 the history of these characters is so rich yeah. and and goes back thousands of years you know thousands and thousands of years and you know we've been we've been saying this to ourselves <laughs> for ourselves mm-hmm. for millennia yeah and, yeah you know but what makes these times very interesting and also a little bit um where the stakes are a little higher mm-hmm. is that you know we're, we're at a time where our capacity, our destructive capabilities are unprecedented, mm-hmm. where, you know, we, we are a truly global society now, where one thing that happens, you know, here in Byron Bay, which is where I am at the moment visiting mm-hmm. um, my mum, what happens here can immediately have an impact on the entire world. If there is some kind of significant calamity, Everybody in the world is going to know about it within 10 minutes. Right. Or, you know, we, well, within 30 seconds of somebody with a mobile phone um, capturing it and mm-hmm. posting it to the, to the web. And our, our ability to influence each other and, and trigger a cascade of events globally is, is almost instantaneous now. Yes. And, you know, the, our capacity to escalate into a global um, crisis um, that could, you know, cause all of us to to be confronted with some some kind of global calamity. It's it's absolutely on the cards. It's mm-hmm. something that we're capable of. We have technology and weaponry that can absolutely annihilate us, and it really doesn't wouldn't take much <laughs> for for that to happen at a certain level at a certain point in time. When our stress levels reach such levels of unsustainability, and we're heading, we're heading in that direction, our, where our stress levels uh, have become so high that we become so incapable of detecting the subtlety and the fineness of our humanity, our, our sense of responsibility, our love, because we all know that when we're so stressed, our ability to, to connect with each other is completely compromised yes. and and that's what we're, we're, we're noticing in the world right now is a global stress epidemic that is causing us to become so dangerously removed from our humanity that it's causing us to behave in ways that are so terrible and so disconnected from our responsibility to be of service to each other mm. that um, we can no longer afford to just keep operating like that with the belief that well you know 
if that thing happens over there, it's not really going to affect right. anything over here. So what does it matter? We now need to see the world in a light where we as individuals, wherever we are in the world, are, are actually having a, a great impact on it. Mm-hmm. And it is our individual responsibility to get into the highest state of love as quickly as possible to mitigate that the, the, the proliferation of stress and right. disconnection and ignorance of the truth of our humanity. Because that is the only thing that is going to destroy us and the, uh, and the, the only thing that is going to uh, cause us to emerge out of this danger is the revelation of our humanity and our responsibility to, to be of service to the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And we, we can only connect and experience that when we connect with ourselves and right. come to know ourselves and who we are. Which brings us back to the four golden insights. <laughs> yes. Life is sacred. Are you living as such? Do you live each moment with an awareness of the sacredness of, it, of, of, our, of our existence? Do, do you connect deeply with the experience of love? Are, are you experiencing love in this moment? Do you feel a spontaneous involuntary impulse to nurture greater connection, growth, and belonging with everybody and everything you behold? Mm-hmm. Do you feel a sense of a deep sense of intelligent knowing of how to, regardless of whether somebody's in agreement with you or not, uh, do you feel a sense of how to connect with others to cause them to to mm-hmm. let go of their defenses for a moment, to open up and to move into their heart and connect with you in in this loving way? Mm-hmm. Do you have that that power? to cause that in another person? And to what extent are you living this as your purpose? This is the call to action. (laughs) If we can, if we can, you know, embrace this as individuals, then we will transform the world. Mm. And this is, this is as far as I'm concerned, you know, our only way out. Yeah. No no government. Yeah. And no, no, no government's going to do it. No policy's going to do it. I know, you know, no, no or NGO, no, we can't outsource this. No. no. None of this can be outsourced. We all have to recognize the role that we play here. Yes. Right now and, and get on board. Agreed. Mm, this is such good stuff, Johnny. I'm so glad. <laughs> Thank you for unpacking all that. If someone wants to find out more about the Golden Sequence, where can they find you and find your book and, and find the app? Um, so the, the Golden Sequence book can be bought online anywhere in the world now. It's, it's mm-hmm. released globally everywhere, like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, mm-hmm. uh, Booktopia, all these different places you can buy it. You can buy them online. Uh, the app, the One Giant Mind app, so that uh, One Giant Mind is a, a meditation organization that's promoting the benefits of meditation. Mm. Um, it's my perspective that in order to be able to do this work that we've been talking about, you know, to successfully move into, uh, surrender into the deeper truth of our humanity, mm-hmm. we first have to have a level of awareness of when we are not surrendered and we are living in a, in a, a mode of defensiveness yeah. uh, and, disconnect, and disconnection. And that requires a, de- a degree of self-awareness. And meditation is the technology that enlivens and awakens self-awareness to the extent that we're always witnessing the experience that we're having. And when we're experience, able to witness the experience that we're having, meaning we're able to observe the thoughts we're having, the feelings that we're feeling, and we are able to observe them non-reactively and engage from a deeper place of intelligence, with those feelings, we, we, we shift from a reactive state to a res- responsive state. Mm-hmm. And we, start, we, we, we are empowered to start living our lives from a, a position of choice and um, power mm-hmm. because we have the, pa- the, the, the power to no longer involuntarily react to life. I, you know, I've created an organization that is dedicated to meditation because I believe that this is the work that needs to be done first. 
You know, yeah. it's it's all all good and well to have the best intentions to be more loving, but if you've got you know stresses from the past deeply embedded in your nervous system that just are constantly wreaking havoc with your experience in the present moment, it's mm-hmm. going to be very difficult for you to create any transformation in your life. We've right. got to deal with the hardware. The software is the intention mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the intelligence, the loving intelligence, but the hardware is our nervous system, our brains. And we've got to we've we've got to actually run a virus scan through our hardware and actually upgrade our hardware, reconnect the broken circuits, and um, and make sure that the operating system um, can really really hum on on this hard drive. And so, you know, for for the love software to run um, without any bugs requires that we really upgrade the the hardware. Meditation rapidly upgrades the hardware very, very quickly. It yeah. refines the nervous system. It increase, increases cognitive function so we can have more dynamic thinking and cognitive capability, coherent introspection. So when we turn our attention inward, we can, we can see ourselves more clearly. That's mm-hmm. what meditation does. Mm-hmm. So um, we, we deliver a, a very easy uh, alert meditation um, technique uh, through the One Giant Mind app. It's a free awesome. app, the mm-hmm. 12-step course, takes you on a, on, a, on a journey of learning it, and then you've got the 30-day challenge, which holds you accountable because after about 30 days, you're like, yeah, this thing's awesome. I'm not going to stop now. And, <laughs> right. and uh, you, you may do stop. You Sometimes we can forget, um, but uh, it's there to support you. Yeah. Um, and we, the other aspect of our, of our organization is that we are a meditation teacher training academy. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we're, we, we think as, as a matter of urgency, the world needs more meditation teachers, uh, because it's just such an easy, elegant technology to cause rapid transformation very mm-hmm. quickly. And yes. it doesn't matter what, what you, what you do, what your profession is, what your interest is. If you're passionate about, um, unfolding human potential, you feel called to this work, then we, you know, I, I strongly encourage you to come and check out our training. It's, um, very achievable. It doesn't require a huge amount of time. Um, it's very affordable and it is one of the most fulfilling ways that you can bring yourself into your community and be a service is okay. making yourself available. And it's a great way to supplement your income as well because you, you know, you, you charge for your courses and it, uh, you know, at, at an affordable rate that makes it, you know, just a win, 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 win for everybody. <laughs> Yeah, I love meditation. The variation I learned was from a Franciscan nun and it's centering prayer, but it can be completely non-religious. And yeah, when I get into the practice of it, and I've led it before too, it's like the fear comes up of what what am I going to find? I mean, it is uh, kind of intimidating what to sit with oneself for a while, but I have found that it is truly amazing as to how you can kind of silence things and get back in tune with that connection of who you are and what it is that your purpose is here for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, okay. it, it just amplifies, amplifies what we are. Yeah. What we truly are. And we, yeah. you know, we, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And all you mm. need to do to yes. confront fear is look at it and feel it and see it for what it is, you know, mm. and, and then we're free of it. So the last question that I ask everyone is what are three ways that you can think of to jumpstart joy in your life, in the world, or in other people's lives? Uh, The first way would be when you wake up every morning, the first thing you do, uh, if you can go outside and and, uh, make visual contact with the sun. Mm -hmm. Because what this does is it connects you to the the physical source of life on the planet and it makes you realize that you're existing in an extraordinary reality in a, on, on an extraordinary planet in an extraordinary universe and just for a moment connect with the reality that you know we are on a, a planet that is hurtling around the sun at 66,000 miles an hour that then the sun is hurtling around the galaxy at 1.3 million miles an hour that, you know, on this planet, despite the fact that we're moving so fast, it can seem very still mm-hmm. and that there are, we're sharing the planet with billions and billions of species and life forms. And 
that it's all underlined by this extraordinary intelligence and we are a part of that intelligence. So that's the first thing, just to connect mm -hmm. with that, that you belong to a world, that you're a part of a universe. And that always sort of just sets the day right. The second thing I would recommend that you do after that is um, sit down and meditate. Set your day, your, set yourself up for success and you hope for your day. The best way to do that is to not look at your phone, not look at emails, uh, not read the newspapers and the headlines. You know, start off by just connecting with yourself first and affirming your humanity, just really connecting in. And there's some wonderful um, tips for how you can do this uh, in the book. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the third uh, is... The, whomever it is that you make contact with first in the morning, show them your best self, mm -hmm. your highest self. Don't be lazy with how you interact. You know, connect, smile, show them that you appreciate their presence and, and really connect because that's the, that, that's the circuitry that we're talking about that's broken. Yeah. You know, we can wake up and, and live in the house with five other people wake up and interact with them with no real connection and sort of go see everybody and walk out the door and not really mm. have connected. Yeah. You know, we, we are connecting beings. We need to connect with each other. So connect with whomever it is that you're present with. And then when you go to work, keep this program going, the connection program. To what extent can you just gently, you know, it doesn't mean you have to, you know, divulge the deepest and darkest things that are happening in your heart at the time or, the most beautiful things that happen in your heart. It's just a gentle connection, but make it real, make it authentic, connect. And what you'll notice is that that will nourish you. It'll energize you and it will energize everybody around you. Uh, life will take on greater meaning. So that, that's three. You only asked for three. I've got a list of about 15 things. <laughs> yeah. but they're, they're, they're three really great ones. They are. Thank you. Yeah, I can see uh, I wake up and... Uh, my son is always the first one I see because my husband's a chef and he's out by about 5 a.m. So, right, yes, yeah. that the little kiddo, he and I. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's, it's very easy, easy to, to do it with them, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, they're present all the time. In uh, the, and the love is there. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, thank you, Johnny. Thank you so much for being on. This has been amazing. My pleasure. It's been a juicy chat. Johnny, thank you so much for being on the show. It's just such a treat to have had this discussion with you. And thank you so much for sharing all of your insights. If you want to find out more about Johnny's book, which I highly recommend, and it's, it is a great read, you can head to the show notes for this episode at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash Johnny, J-O-N-N-I. You can also find it online. It is The Golden Sequence. And if you're thinking of starting a podcast of your very own this season, you can find a great cheat sheet. It will give you a full list of all the hardware and software that I use to create this show each week. And you can find that at the website too, jumpstartyourjoy.com. Look for the Start a Podcast button on the right-hand side of the homepage. Next week on the show, I am also super duper excited to have Jess Ekstrom. She is the founder of Headbands of Hope, and we met last year at a conference. I was super excited to have her on the show and just love this amazing conversation that we had. Really just felt like a conversation between two friends, and it's so much fun when that happens in an interview format. So she'll be on next week. I hope you guys will come back for that. Until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much joy. 